Hey, greetings everyone. Lieutenant Colonel Allen West here and welcome to the Steadfast and Loyal Podcast. You gotta light them up before they burn it down. Greetings, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Allen West. In my career from the battlefield to Congress, honor and integrity have always been my compass. When it comes to building a precious metals portfolio for my family, I choose United Patriot Corps. Their commitment to honesty and transparency aligns with everything I stand for. They care about our great country and focus on serving patriots from all walks of life. They've teamed up with veterans of the precious metals market to create a new kind of gold dealer designed to serve the needs of a new type of gold buyer. And that's why I know I can trust them when it comes time to buy my gold and silver. If you value honesty and reliability as I do, then join me. Hey, greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the Staff Fast and Law podcast. You know, 2024 is such an important election season. But one of the things, and I'm a national spokesperson for an organization called My Faith Votes. On average, only 25% of Christians go out and vote in a presidential election cycle. So imagine if it's a midterm election cycle. Imagine if it's you know county or even local, it, the number just drops. And I think what you are seeing from the left is a dedicated attack against Christians right now to try to prevent them from going out and vote. And, you know, you always have people referring back to Romans chapter 13 in the Bible talking about Christians are supposed to be subject to governance and government. Well, you're supposed to render unto Caesar what is Caesar and render unto God what is God. And you're supposed to be going after righteous governance not government that will shut down your church while leaving Home Depot, McDonald's, abortion clinics, and marijuana stores open. So to talk about that issue and some other things, we've got William Wolf. William is a 10-year veteran of the conservative political movement. He served as a senior official in the Trump administration, both as a deputy assistant secretary of defense at the Pentagon and a director of legislative affairs at the Department of State. He has a bachelor's of arts degree in history from Covenant College and a master's of divinity at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Combining his political experience and theological education, William plans to pursue a PhD with a focus on Christian ethics and public theology entering pastoral ministry and engaging at the intersection of faith and politics, cultural commentary, and Christian worldviews. William, thanks for joining us here at the Steph Absolutely. Podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. Well, fantastic. So tell us, what brought you into the Dallas, Texas area, the, the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex? Yeah, I came here to, uh, to meet up with some folks who I'm working uh, with on an effort to help rally the Southern Baptist Convention in particular mm -hmm. to be more active in the public square, but also to address some critical issues that are facing the Southern Baptists. Yeah. They're the largest Protestant denomination in the country. Yeah. And they've been subject to a real intense and targeted attack from leftists, from mm -hmm. globalists, mm -hmm. to try to subvert, fracture us, not only because they don't like our Christian commitments, because, but because they recognize the Southern Baptist Convention is a critical part of the American evangelical voting bloc in our country. Yeah, because we've got uh, Pastor Jeffress over there, First Baptist uh, in Dallas, mm -hmm. and a very engaged and involved guy. When you talk about the Southern Baptist Convention and Bart Barber mm -hmm. heads it up, I remember seeing him last year on 60 Minutes, and I'm thinking, this guy's just surrendering. Mm -hmm. He's not standing up for our Christian faith. And what was it, Anderson Cooper? Anderson Cooper. I mean, every time Anderson Cooper brought something, like, yeah, we don't need to do this. We don't need, we're involved too much in politics. How did you feel about that interview? Well, I don't think, I felt very well represented. And I, I'm pretty confident that the vast majority of the Southern Baptist faithfuls in the pew across America didn't feel well represented or defended either. 
because the reality is that the secular left and the media hates people like us in our country. It's sad, yeah. but true. And so what we need right now in the Southern Baptist Convention and across all of American Christianity are bold leaders who don't apologize at all. Yeah. They don't apologize that we believe what the Bible teaches and that we don't keep our faith in our churches and our homes, but we take it into the public square and even into the voting booth. You know, that's an interesting thing because I, I think that the left doesn't understand that very first liberty that we have and the Bill of Rights, which is the freedom of religion and free exercise thereof. They, they want us to have a freedom of worship. They want to define where that worship place is. And so I often tell people, when you look back at March 2020, the very first thing that the government went after were churches. Mm -hmm. You know, after 9-11, everyone wanted to go to a church. Mm -hmm. But now all of a sudden, churches become the bad guy. And, and now we have this new term called Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that. What do you think the left is really trying to do? Because that has just popped up in the last year, year and a half, this term Christian nationalism. Well, you got to hand it to the left. They, they can come up with some pretty catchy terms sometimes. And I think when you're hearing the label Christian nationalism from the left in particular, whether it's from secular scholars or from the media, they mean it as a pejorative. Mm -hmm. But they're trying to make something sound scary that's not really scary at all because Christian nationalism to them just means someone like you or me voting our values yeah. and trying to uh, trying to advocate for just laws in our nation that protect all of us, including the unborn, yes. that recognizes individual rights, you know, life, liberty, and justice, that defends the natural family. Yeah. And so it, I think really what it is is an effort to silence and ultimately disenfranchise conservative Christian voters in America. You know, so many Christians are confused about this separation of church and state thing. They, they don't understand that it's not in the Declaration, it's not in the Constitution, not in Federalist Papers. I mean, Thomas Jefferson wrote it in a letter to the Danbury Baptist Convention mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, Connecticut. And the concern was that the Baptists thought that the Presbyterians were getting a leg up, mm -hmm. and, and they did not want to say that. And Jefferson said, you know, there, there won't be any state-sponsored religion and, and what have you. But it seems that the left has created their own religion. Oh, absolutely. Right, the new religion of uh, America today is, is wokeness and all its different manifestations, critical race theory, DEI, radical gender ideology, and they demand that you submit to their catechism. Yes. They make you want, I thought Vivek had a great interchange with a reporter one time when they were trying to get him to denounce white supremacy. And he's like, look, of course I denounce all sorts and forms of racial hatred, but I'm not going to say your catechism question here for you. Mm -hmm. they, they view it as sort of like an initiation into their religion. And so I think in an increasingly secular age that we live in, it's not really that people are becoming less religious, it's that they're trading in the American context our historic Christian commitments for new radical commitments that are fundamentally a sort of Marxist form of religion. And Karl Marx had nothing to do with religion. I mean, he absolutely hated religion. He called it the opiate of the masses. And so what is going on in our churches? Why do we have so many pastors that are surrendering, much the same as we saw this Bart Barber do in that 60 Minutes interview. Uh, and he's the head of the Southern Baptist Convention. Mm -hmm. and, and it was just like Anderson Cooper owned him. What is going on in our churches? Why, why can't we have pastors that, you know, this is our Black Robe Regiment Tomahawk, and everybody out there knows about this. And it says right there, 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 5, preach the word in season and out. Mm -hmm. Too many of our pastors want to tickle people's ears now, it seems. Well, that's certainly true, and I call it the status anxiety of American evangelicals. They want to be welcomed by the elites. They want to have a seat at the table. They want op-eds in the New York Times or you know columns at the Atlantic. And when I say that, of course, people will know I'm referencing people like David French and Russell Moore. But the problem is over the last many decades here in America that too many Christian pastors have bought into the lie of the myth of neutrality, that the public square is neutral and that it's not a battleground of ideas and beliefs and even competing religions. Mm -hmm. And Christians have every right to go out there and to say, we believe the Bible is true and it applies to every area of life. Abraham Kuyper was a famous Dutch pastor and politician who said, there's not a single square inch in creation over which God does not say mine. 
And so I think the reason we've had weak pastors, particularly on the issues of politics, is because they don't want to be offensive. They don't want to offend the left. They don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers. And they just want to try to go along to get along. But that day and age is over. I mean, COVID made that very clear. Yeah. You know, it's time It's time to fight for our values, in, not only in the church, but in the public square. You know, Romans 12, too, says that, you know, as Christians, you're not supposed to conform to the world, but you're supposed to transform it through the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. And I just don't understand why we have people that want to war that. You, you know, when I go into certain church parking lots and I see some bumper stickers on cars, I got to say, you're confused. <laughs> okay, if you're going to church and you got this bumper sticker on, mm -hmm. why do you think people have this, this inner misunderstanding or this inner conflict whereby they will go in on a Sunday, shout hallelujah and whatever, and then they trade in all of those Judeo-Christian faith principles and values for a political philosophy mm -hmm. that's the antithesis of what they say they believe in. Yeah, the, that's a that's a great question, and let me try to answer it in a concise fashion because there's a lot of different avenues you could run down with that. But there's well, got time. Take yeah, time. well, so I think there's a couple of things. Obviously, coming out of the the World War II era, there was a real intentional effort with a, a philosophy that came from a guy named Karl Popper. Who wrote the Open Societies and its Enemies, mm -hmm. and his, you know, he was writing in a post World War II, you know, era, and he was trying to explain how we avoid World War III ever happening again. That's understandable, but he said the things that the global elites need to do is they need to downplay religious affections and religious commitments, downplay national loyalties and love of country, and sort of move us towards an open borders, neutral, increasingly mm -hmm. secular society. Now, you know who uh, penned a forward to a later edition of Open Society and Its Enemies? George Soros. Mm -hmm. And so this- That's the name of his organization. That's the name of his organization. That's right. And, and so over many decades now, there have been globalist groups with you know significant financial backing that have been infiltrating the Christian church, the Southern Baptists, the Presbyterians. You know, we had a guy, Rick Warren, who was a very well-known pastor in the Southern Baptist Purpose Convention. Purpose Driven Life. Purpose Driven Life, who he got caught up in the Davos class and Davos crowd. And so we see this also in evangelical and even Catholic organizations that are rather than helping stop the flow of illegal immigration are perpetrating it with their, with their um, ministries. And so we've been infiltrated and subverted by the cultural Marxists and their long march through the institutions. Yeah. And so that's, that's really, I think, at the heart of it. And I frankly think we have a lack of leadership. You know, I love your reference to the Black Robe Regiment. Those men were fighters. Yes, they were. In the pulpit and outside of yes, it. Yes, they were. And so what we need now is a new, uh, a new courageous, unapologetic class of leadership, of pastors and men who are going to stand on God's word in the pulpit, in the public square, and, and not care what the world thinks about it. Now, I'm going to be 63 here in, in, a, in a day. Mm -hmm. Happy so, birthday. Well, thank you. Some people will look and say, you know, Wes, you're just old, you're antiquated, no one cares about that, you know, how you think and believe. How are we tapping into the, the next generation, your generation? I mean, do you see something that's changing with that generation? Well, the statistics show, unfortunately, that my generation uh, is increasingly irreligious, the rise of mm -hmm. the nuns in American life. At the same time, however, uh, studies show that young men in particular are becoming more conservative. So they're not necessarily becoming more Christian or religious, but they are becoming more conservative. So I think that that's what the Bible would call a field that's ripe for the harvest. Yes. And unfortunately, and this gets back to the weak pastors, is that too many pastors, as they've watched the rise of secularism, they thought they had to water down the Christian message to evangelize the left. You know, they wanted, they viewed politics almost as a form of missions, which that's, politics isn't missions. Politics is about justice. It's about yeah. good laws. We can't water down what the Bible says good laws should be to have an evangelistic strategy. And so what I think I'm most encouraged by are the strong Christian pastors out there who recognize that punch right, coddle left is not a good strategy anymore, but we should actually be actively appealing to the young generation that's disaffected by the madness, the societal mm -hmm. breakdown with transgenderism and, and yeah. DEI, and whether or not they're Christians, I think that they are open to hearing about a cohesive message, of course, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. but how to, how to get a girl, how to get married, raise a family, yeah. have kids, and, and form the good life. And the Christian faith has the foundation for all of that. 
So I do hope that this, this generation of very conservative young men in particular will be right for the gospel message. You know, I see so many young people coming out, and this was a brutal march for life, mm. but they're still out there. Mm -hmm. And so that gives me the, the, the hope and belief. How can we bridge that gap? You know, like I said, from how old are you? 30? 35. So how can we bridge that gap, of, you know, between me and you? How can, you know... I can be a better teacher, coach, mentor, or whatever, an example to your generation. How does that happen? That's a, that's a great question. There is, unfortunately, some, I think, uh, generational antipathy, right? You see it in the news between boomers and millennials, yeah. right? And so I think one of the things that your generation could do is really, really work to help invest in that younger generation, to, to sympathize with them and the struggles that they're facing. I know for many in, in, in my generation and even younger, they feel like the basic things that made up the American dream owning a home, mm -hmm. you know, you know, living on a single income. You know, when Blake Masters ran for Senate in Arizona, he yeah. had a great ad where he said, families should be able to raise their children on a single income. That sounds unthinkable in America today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think advocating for those things that would help the younger generations form those, those needed bases of a stable family life would be very helpful um, and helping raise up a new generation. Unfortunately, I think, particularly in the church, there's been sort of a, a, a mishandoff of the baton. Yes. You know, a lot of uh, folks in your generation, as they pick the leaders that sort of live in the intra generation between us, they pick guys who were on paper sounding good or they preached well, but they got caught up in the wokeness. Yeah. And so we need to find men now who are gonna reject the wokeness and stand strong. So picking good leaders, sympathizing with millennials and the Zoomers on their struggles, and you know, and just praying that God would help heal our national divide. Now, of course, the, the leftists that will watch this little segment will say, you two knuckleheads are talking about a theocracy. And we don't <laughs> want a theocracy. But in truth, that's what they're promoting. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there it's a it's a new paganism. Yeah. Right? And and their 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 god is is, you know, fill in the blank. It's the god of diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, and they're just Mola, the, the god of the child god sacrifice. Of huh? Child sacrifice. Yeah, um Josh McWhorter, or John McWhorter, I might be uh, forgetting his first name, mm -hmm. you know, he, he's not a Christian. He's an African-American scholar who he has written a book arguing that wokeness functions as a new religion. Mm -hmm. So even some on the left are able to recognize it. And so now, look, I'm not advocating for a theocracy, but the reality is every society in all of human history has had a, trans, a transcendent moral judgment point, yeah. right? Yeah. And you know the basic Christian formulation of this is that God is over the government. And so if you remove the one true God from over the government, then the government itself and whatever ideology it wants becomes your God. And as you said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, but to God what is God. Mm -hmm. And worship and belief and faith can only be given to the one true God. And so, look, if that makes me a Christian nationalist, then I guess sign me up. Yeah, I'm with but you, I man. think that just makes me an American Christian. Absolutely. And, and, and so what I always tell people is that there is no other nation in the world, when you read our Declaration of Independence, that says that the individual is sovereign. Mm -hmm. And the individual is sovereign because their life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, property, mm -hmm. John Locke, Second mm -hmm. Treaties of Government, 1683, but those inalienable rights come from the Creator God. That's right. That is revolutionary when you think about it. And I believe that what the left is trying to do is to undermine the omnipotence and the omniscience of God to say that. God, you know, this Adam and Eve thing, you can choose whatever gender you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, God wouldn't, he, the weather, I mean, we, we control the weather. It's kind of like going back to the Tower of Babel. We're going to build this tower, and we're going to go up there and be equal to God. That's a very dangerous premise, don't you think? Well, well yes, it is, and it didn't work before, you know, and so it's not going to work again. You know, Genesis 1-1 might be the most disputed statement of our time. Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah. And that's actually one of the most political statements. It wasn't the Big Bang Theory? Yeah, no, I don't think it so. It wasn't that guy on, you know, what's his name that's on that show, Big Bang Theory, the well, physicist? Yeah, or Sheldon or whatever. Sheldon, yeah, young yeah. Sheldon, this Sheldon, that Sheldon. Yeah. The, uh, the idea that everything that we see here, that our intricate human bodies would be the process of random evolutions over millions of period, you know, millions of uh, years, all stemming from a, quote, random flux in the quantumness of nothingness, 
that takes way more faith. That's than, deep. I couldn't even know, say that. You know, than but, believing that God yeah. made everything. But you know, Genesis one one is incredibly political. The fact that Jesus Christ is Lord is an incredibly political yeah. statement. Yeah. And I'm I'm not ashamed to proclaim that. And I hope that other Christians wouldn't be either. Well, I think that's the moment that we're in right now. Uh, and I think that that is what God is looking for. And, you know, I see it as trials and tribulations, as it says in Romans 5, 3 through 5. It is there for us to build our perseverance. And uh, perseverance, you know, therefore builds our proven character. And our proven character builds up our hope. It's not the hope in man. Do you think that the body of Christ will rise to the occasion and the challenges that we see? Well, I absolutely believe that because the body of Christ is not dependent upon the strength of its own members, but on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's interesting when Christ promises us that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, that, uh, that is uh, actually a defensive posture. I think people misunderstand that sometimes. They think that it's the gates, you know, the hell is approaching Marching us. Marching us. But yeah. no, we're coming after them, yeah. and their gates will not stand up against us. And so we know that Christians are victors. Maybe not More than conquerors. Not, maybe not necessarily in this life, in every way, shape, or form. There will be suffering, but Christ is not in the tomb, and He's not on the cross. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And that's our hope, and that's the hope that we proclaim in churches, and again in the public square, and then I hope in the Southern Baptist Convention. So, what's next for you, William? Right. What's next for me is I'm, uh, you know, I'm sort of like LeBron James trying to take my talents <laughs> to Miami. Uh, I'm trying, I'm trying to bring my my political background and experience, and then my Baptist history and theological training to help lead an effort within the Southern Baptist Convention to bring us back to our historical theological commitments to conservatism, mm -hmm. to belief in the inerrancy and sufficiency of Scripture, and then to help us be a better Baptist voice in the public square. You know, I want to have bold Baptist leaders leading the charge in America, because whether you're Southern Baptist or not, what happens in our convention impacts all of American Christianity. There are a lot of other denominations out there dealing with the woke fights right now, mm -hmm. the Presbyterians, the Methodists, and they're looking at what happens to us. Are we going to hold the line um, on, on wokeness or not? And so I'm trying to put together a team and help people stand strong and raise up a new generation of Southern Baptist leaders who will advocate for our Christian beliefs and our Baptist beliefs in the public square without apology. And how do you cross over all the lines that that the secular world puts out there because some people say, okay, William, all that stuff you're talking about is just for white people, which is totally wrong. There ain't no color, sure. you know, in, in, the, uh, in the body of Christ. So how do you bring all of us together to understand that message in the Southern Baptist Convention? Well, you know what is fascinating is that in one of the anti-Christian nationalist books, Taking America Back for God, according to the study that the sociologists did, uh, African-American respondents actually uh, tracked more Christian nationalists than, than the white folks did. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, again, the, the, the message of Christ in the Bible is a unifying message. It doesn't matter your background, mm -hmm. your ethnicity, you know, your skin color. And so I think that you know, we just want to speak the truth and be faithful and trust God with the results. I don't want to manufacture diversity, right? Yeah. You know, you know what's a very diverse place? Hell. Hell is very diverse, right? And, and it's too hot for me. And heaven will I be like very heat. diverse yeah. too. But you know, I'm not going to pursue manufactured diversity. But I hope that if I speak truth and encourage others to do the same, then that truth will appeal to people, regardless of their background. You know, I have always told folks that on a Sunday, the most conservative people in the United States of America, it ain't white. Oh, yeah. It's, it's the black community. But if we don't engage them and get them to understand that connection between their their faith principles and values, that heritage, and then also their interaction and relationship with the government and the governing body, then that's where we lose them, mm -hmm. just the same as in all communities. So I want to applaud you for what you're doing. And how can people follow you? How can people you know stay in touch with you and mm -hmm. support you? in your endeavors. Sure. Well, you can uh, you can find me on X, formerly Twitter, yeah. at William underscore E underscore Wolf with an E, William Wolf on X. And that's the main way to connect with me these days. Uh, stay tuned here in the next week or so. My, my new effort will be uh, out in public and we'll have a website and you can find that on my uh, Twitter as well and people can contact me that way. Your final word to the audience out there, why is this important? This is so important because 
the future of America hangs in the balance. If you care about the next generation, then I think that you should care about what happens with the Southern Baptist Convention. If you're listening to this and you're a Southern Baptist, we need you to come to our annual meeting in Indianapolis this year to vote for the conservative cause and future of our convention. And you do it not just for Southern Baptists, but you do it for America, you do it for your children, and you do it for the future, all trusting the Lord with the outcome and with this gospel message that he has entrusted us to take to the ends of the earth. And folks, remember 2 Corinthians 3 and 17, that the Lord is the spirit where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So if we allow the progressive, socialist, secular left to erase the spirit of the Lord in this country that was founded on that Judeo-Christian faith heritage, then we will not have freedom for our future generations. We will have subservience, we will have subjugation. We will have secularism that takes away your true freedom and liberty. William, thank you so very much for being here. You're an impressive young man. Thank you, sir. Glad All to right. be here. God bless. And ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this episode and this conversation with William, please click the like button and share it with others. And until next time, steadfast in the Lord. Before they burn it down.